All right. I'd like to call to order the New York City Transit Committee meeting. Let's get started with our safety announcements. Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed to stairwell D or E for assistance by MTA staff or emergency personnel. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Thanks. Let's move on to our public speakers, please. Good morning, Chair. We have 18 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker is Iris Kelly, followed by Murray Bowden. My concern is the accessibility accessoride is that when we're in uh, emergency situations and they tell us, no, you can't get it right if, if it's only a return trip, and that is not right. It can be many times we have an emergency going one way and not knowing things happen, and we have to get ourselves out of a predicament. If we can't help us, there's no way we can advocate ourselves. We really need help. For instance, I was in a uh, place at Long Island for a time and it ended later than expected. Okay, I'm getting to a land term like that. We need a ride to get home. No, you tell me I can't if you only have a return trip, and that's not right. Things can happen to people at any time of day, whether coming or going returns. Thank you. Our next speaker is Murray Bowden, followed by John Padula. Hey, Rich. This for you. Federal Highway Administration just came out with that 2023 Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices. I met the head of the Federal Highway Administration. He spoke at the NIMTIC meeting. He thinks like I do. He thinks like my grandchildren do. He's got young kids, and he understands we're not all the same. What they did was to take out the warrants where everybody has to meet a certain requirement. He said, you guys are smart on a local level. You're all different. You know best, do it legally, but change it to make it safer. The lines on a road were designed 50 years ago. You have the opportunity to correct them. Where a snowplow goes, people don't make like that. Nobody can drive that way, so why are the lines that way? You know, also increased when you put all the yellow lines on the left and the white on the right, it'll make it safer for the GPS to find out where they are. Now, it's not well understood. I had a conversation with the Greenberg Planning Commissioner just two days ago. He had no idea what this book can do for you. So I'd like you, I request that you set up a meeting with me and staff to discuss what it actually can do to help you, what it can do to save you money, and make your uh, buses go faster. They're using road lines that were designed 50 years ago for a different world. You gotta have electric buses. You're doing all kinds of wonderful planning. 
I, I see people happier than they have been. I have to leave right now. I have a webinar on uh, climate at 2 o'clock, and I want to get back for that. So if you can set up a meeting just to discuss where does it go Thank from here. Thank you for your we comment. Don't know. Thank you very much. I'm getting out. I'm sorry I can't. Our next speaker is John Padula, followed by Monicia Bartley. Our first speaker was Monicia Bartley, followed. Okay. Where am I? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Padula, and I'm a supervisor with Educational Vision Services from New York City Public Schools. I'm also the chair of the Advisory Committee for Transit Accessibility. Unfortunately, I guess it is a manic Monday of sorts. I have another insufferable tale of woe having to do with uh, broker service and CTG. I had an 8.32 pickup this morning to be here for 9.50. Never mind that the vehicle was 18 minutes late and then I proceeded to get carted around town for another 90 minutes on top of that. I don't know how a 108 minute trip is comparable to fixed route service. But all that aside, what I really love you to hear is how the driver did give me a call five minutes before he arrived to say that he was five minutes away um, and, you know, that he was coming and he was in traffic. And I said, oh, great. I says, I, listen, I happen to be blind. I use a cane. Um, please, you know, come to me because I won't be able to see you. He says, oh, you canceled trip? I says, no. I said, I'm blind and I use a cane. He hangs up. Dispatcher calls me. So after I explained it to the dispatcher, she just kind of like laughs and says, okay, I'll take care of it and whatever, but I'm glad she was amused. Look, I don't know how it's safe. I don't know how it's purposeful if you're blind, if you're a person who uses a wheelchair, if you're in a moving vehicle in New York City and you don't have any meaningful access to the information around you, these drivers have to be able to communicate with us. We have to be able to communicate with them. Something has to be done. Phase three, we need usable, ethical, on-demand, because that's the only way to mitigate some of this. You guys can't handle this volume. CTG has the car power, but they don't have a quality of driver to do the work. So something has to be done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monicia Bartley, followed by Tasha Larabors. Good morning. My name is Monica Bartley, a member of DIA, Disabled in Action. I'm a regular user of Accessoride, which is my main mode of transportation. And I'm concerned about the reliability of the service. We were conditioned to the 30 minutes wait after your scheduled pick up time. But in recent weeks, this has become 45 minutes to an hour. This impacts our appointments that are not flexible, such as doctor's appointments, attending a Broadway show, and being a guest presenter at a meeting. As a result, some appointments have to be rescheduled when we arrive late. It is difficult for a wheelchair user to enter a function without disturbing the proceedings, and no one wants to be the center of attention not to mention the anxiety and frustration we experience wondering if our ride is going to show up. We deserve better. Come on, Accessor Ride, step up your game. We need a more reliable service. Lost time can never be regained. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tasha Larabors, followed by Vincent Padula. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tasha Larabors. I work for Center for Independence of the Disabled, New York. And I'm once again here to talk about Accessoride. Um, I know oftentimes uh, the MTA speaks of the 79% satisfaction rate. Uh, but as an Accessoride user and an advocate for other Accessoride users, um, 
something I would love more than anything is if fellow board members would get the opportunity to use the service. Use the service and get a glimpse of drivers yelling at the passengers and kicking them out of the vehicle. Get a glimpse of drivers yelling at a passenger, cursing them out, uh, just because they tell, ask them, you know, can you please drop me off in front of the building instead of, you know, a, a block away. You know, get a glimpse of all this behavior in terms of with uh, broker service because it's sad to say, you know, there's a, another issue as well with broker service is the language barrier. A lot of people trying to communicate with the drivers, but the drivers don't understand. You know, as I've mentioned in the past, when a driver uh, comes to pick me up, they just show me their phone that has the, uh, their name, that has my name. You know, I realize, as I said, get a glimpse. Try figuring out, you know, what the problem is because even though you guys speak of the 79% satisfaction, there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vincent Padula, followed by Maddie Bucky's Highland. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vincent Padula, here as a citizen of New York and somebody who has used Accessoride for over 20 years. And I have to say, we really need to fund on demand because back in the beginning, from 2017 to 2023, I suffered very little discrimination with my guide dog. I already said Mr. Ride was being petty, wise, pound stupid. Even when I was discriminated against, even when other patrons were forced to get into a vehicle with my service animal, and I was thrown out of the vehicle and forced to be humiliated in the public and pay my way, they still have not documented. And Chris himself, the director, said to me, oh, well, it's not our policy. So we'll shame people. Shame on you, Mr. Ride. Our city is ready to take on migrants, ready to take on strangers, ready to take on, in my estimation, uh, very unsafe individuals. Our city is being invaded, and we spent over $600 million to invite foreigners in who aren't documented. We don't know how safe they are. Our subways needed to be defended. But yet we can't fund a program that worked for the most weakest of our population, the disabled population that had a program that worked. So you break the program that works and you fund programs that you don't know how to even handle. So please, this would be fixed by an on-demand that would work. The broker service is handled, but we don't have drivers that can speak language. So please, what do you hear about on-demand? We need to know what the new on-demand will be. Some of us who can use on will offload from the system. We need an on-demand, but properly funded and used. Thank you so much, man. And I'm hoping for a better 2024 which actually works. Out. Our next speaker is Maddie Bucky's Highland, followed by Monique Johnson. Oh, hey. hey, good good morning. Good morning. Uh, good, I mean, good afternoon. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm Maddie W. Bucky's Highland. For, for today's topic, I'm going to speak about safety and crime on the on the on our trains and our buses as well this is a book called criminal justice today i took in 11th grade in high school high school and you know this is relates to safety as i'm going to speak to you about today's topic um bail reform is a, is a big issue that's regarding uh, that that's plaguing our system um, in the relation to our things, I I ask our senators and assembly members to please fix our criminal justice laws and have you know, prevent repeat offenders from from terrorizing our our innocent people as crime is up. So therefore, uh, one more thing I would like to add is my name was not included in the February minutes. If you could correct that, I would appreciate it. Thank you, and may God bless each every one of you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monique Johnson, followed by Robert Weeks. Uh, 
Hi, I want to talk about the bus, the 45 bus, the 67 bus, and the 41 bus. Over there by Atlanta and Flatbush Avenue, they're not pulling up to the curves. We cannot get on the bus, and then when we want to, somebody want to help us to come down so we can be able to get on the bus, the buses pull off. They won't even wait till we go down to that little curve to where we could go down safely and come around. No, they pull off, and this has been happening for the last two months. They need to pull up to the sidewalk so people of any, whether you're disabled or not, should be able to get on the bus properly. That's it. Our next speaker is Robert Weeks, followed by Yvonne Lee. Hello everyone, my name is Robert Weeks. Um, I have a problem with the M14. There's two different buses runs on 14th Street. They says there's a 14A and a 14D, or a 14B is in Brooklyn. But my situation is we don't know which one is it because when it comes and when they open the door, they're not telling us nothing. And the announcement they said, they cannot, the, the operator cannot turn off that announcement, but it do happen. Like, for example, when I'm on 23rd Street, they said this is the M23 to Chelsea Pairs. Why the B14 cannot give me that announcement? Because many times I'm trying to go to the water, to the west side, and then the bus takes a left and goes somewhere downtown. Something needs to be done as well. Just like on West 4th Street, the B and D train is not telling us which one it is, but the F and M is doing a good job. Is anything doing about this? We need some action because we can get to the destination. We can get lost and we don't know where we are. We need some action. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yvonne Lee, followed by Jean Ryan. Good morning. My name is Yvonne Lee. And this is a list that I've compiled of the complaints that I've experienced and had over the past year that happened at least three times while I was taking transit. First off, I have issues with the Omni reloading, suspension of the travel card. There should also be a cap for express buses. And numerous times the Omni has been out of service. On many occasions with the Metro card machines, it'll, it'll display no bills, no coins, or credit card only. Then after waiting, the machine doesn't give you a receipt. You should also be able to transfer from a bus to a train with the paper Metro card and not have to pay a separate fare to continue to your destination. The express bus needs to run more frequently and I've also seen how the wheelchair lift malfunctions on several occasions. On the subway, there is excess crime, as everyone knows. Something has to be done about the fare jumpers. I've experienced transit workers that have slept in sleeping in booths. The stations need elevators in order to be wheelchair friendly. We have flooding during the rainstorms that needs to be addressed. The subway system has to be cleaned thoroughly and disinfected. And there is too much of the smell in the subways. And now we have the marijuana smells as well. We also have um, filthy ceilings, flaking tiles, urination, rats, and homeless sleeping on the platforms. And all of this needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Ryan, followed by Christopher Greif. Good morning. I'm Jean Ryan. I'm president of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York, DIA for short. I'm going to talk about this building today. Uh, we come here regularly. And when we come to a meeting on, on uh, the, either the committee meetings or the board meetings, 
we never know if we're going to be able to bring our own water up here. Sometimes the cops downstairs make us pour it out and don't allow us to bring it in. Sometimes they do, like today I could bring my water in. We never know. There's no consistent policy, and this has been going on for months. And it should be straightened out with the management company or whoever it is who decides what the cops have to do with us when they search our bags. We're not against having our bags searched, but we're against inconsistent policies of whether we can bring our own water up here or not. It's just ridiculous. On a plane, you get, they, they serve you water or drinks you know, after you get in the plane. Well, nobody's serving us water here, and we're not asking for it. We're asking to bring our own water up here so that we can drink when we're up here for hours. Uh, the other thing is the ADA counter downstairs. The security count counter downstairs on the first floor is too high and is not ADA compliant. But there is a low part on the, to the left, and there is a sign directing people with disabilities to go to the left in, uh, for the times when we have to have our picture taken and get a, a paper you know, to come in so for a meeting or something. Well, that camera that has not been working for years, years, and I've been asking for it repeatedly, and they never do anything about it. So if you're really concerned about security, get that camera Thank working. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher D. Greif. As an advocate for disability and dealing with a lot of things that we have to challenge, I am fully supporting the congestion pricing because we need it for accessibility, not just elevators and ramps, better lighting, updating our signages to make sure that signages direct us to the nearest accessible elevator slash ramp, LD lighting, we need that as well, and update our bus stops as well as our buses. We need to make very clear that our buses is extremely important to make sure, make fully accessible. I agree with the MTA who spoke the other day 100% as well as the MTA accessibility. But we need everyone to support this because we need the accessibility. It is too many cars, too many trucks blocking access and how can we get to our destination? It's hard enough to get off a bus when there's a vehicle in the way. We need to work with MTA and DOT and NYPD to please get the vehicles off the bus stops, including their own vehicles as well. We need to remind them that even in case of the fire and emergency, and that vehicle is blocking the fire hydrant, how are we supposed to get to deal with that fire if that's a real emergency? We have to clear the fire hydrants and bus stops, but we need to support the congestion pricing 1 million percent. As, an, as, a, as a, my fellow colleague who's right behind me on this plaque will support, was, was advocating for it, as well as all other advocates. Please support this congestion pricing 1 million percent. This is for accessibility, seniors, and veterans. Thank you, everyone. Our next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by Andy Pollack. Good morning, Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. So this month has been a trying month for New York City Transit with all of the crime going on in the subway system. And one thing I don't understand, and this is something I'm going to bring up tomorrow, guys, at the special meeting that we're having. What I want to know is this. Why are the subway mezzanines and certain unstaffed areas open overnight? Uh, we have rampant drug use going on. We have people shooting up needles at the 7th Avenue, 53rd Street station. We have an open-air drug market going on at 110th Street on the 2 and 3 line. Uh, Fifth Avenue, we have a homeless encampment going on over there. So again, guys, overnight, certain entrances need to be closed. Certain mezzanines need to be closed. So like this, the police have more areas where they can patrol, and that makes things safer for them. As far as train crews, at night, after the chiefs and everyone are gone, guess what happens? When the train crews need police assistance, it's taking them a long time to get it. 
So what I'm proposing is that there should be police officers at every other station and the transit workers should know where these police officers are going to be. So last night we had a stabbing on the J line. A man was stabbed in the back in the back. And this afternoon, uh, this earlier this morning, we had a stabbing at outside the 96th Street subway station. So as I've been saying, you know, you can add police and play games and add the chiefs. But after the police are gone and the chiefs are gone, it's back to regular business in New York City transit, where drugs rule, crime rules, and the subway system is out of control. It's fair city all over again. And I'm begging all of you, you know, who's going to be the next victim in the subway system? When are we going to learn to get our system under control? Thank, Thank you, you for your comment. Our next speaker is Andy Pollack, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Thank you, Lucille. Good morning, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Andy Pollack, for the record, Passengers United. So, what are we going to talk about this month? Well, let's talk about some actual good news beginning next Monday, April 1st. The F line is going to be going back to its regular route, going to 21st Street, Queensbridge, and then going to 63rd Street, and then 57th Street. So that's some excellent news. However, in Queens, we're still antsy about the escalator situation at the Jackson Heights Roosevelt Avenue station. We still have to go up the annoying stairwell, which is um, I had to, I had to go up it a couple weeks ago, and it's it's not a pleasant experience. Let's just say that. So we still want an answer on when the escalators, the three remaining escalators, are going to be done at Jackson Heights Roosevelt Avenue. Um, another issue that I have particularly on the subway system is Kew Gardens Union Turnpike. It seems that Kew Gardens Union Turnpike, we're having a situation with our turnstile at 78 Drive. The situation at 78 Drive is every time I've had to go past the turnstile, how come every time in the past two months when I swipe my Metro card, how come I don't hear the beep noise? I mean, what's going on? Because I had to jump the turnstile two months ago when I already swiped my Metro card. So what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to take a video of it. I'm going to send it to the at NYCT subway account when I go over there tomorrow. And I'm going to see if it's, you know, still the same problem. And I'll keep you guys posted on Wednesday when I speak at the board meeting regarding congestion pricing. So with that, I conclude my remarks for this month. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jesse Figueroa, followed by David Kupferberg. Greetings, everybody. Um, my name's Jesse Figueroa, U.S. Army veteran. I am in full support of congestion pricing, and I am in confident that this vote will pass on Wednesday. Um, I am an advocate myself, and many others who are here, and um, I'd I like to say you guys do a hell of a job. I do the complaints. I go to the MTA app more than I call 511. I've seen every other uh, teenager do subway surfing. I see them and I report it, and including the vandalism at my home station, 86th Street, about a couple of weeks ago. So I wear this as pride. I support the MTA. I, I support transit workers. So I wear it with pride. I'm a veteran myself, so I was born in this country raised and, and fought for this country. I will die for this country. So I will continue advocating until the day I die. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Kupferberg, followed by Jack Nuremberg. Hi, my name is David Kupferberg, Vice President of Bus Advocacy, Passengers United. In the Queens Bus Network redesign proposed final plan, the MTA wishes to eliminate bus service in the Rockaways via Newport Avenue by cutting back the Q22 from Beach 169th Street to Beach 116th Street and shifting the Q35. The people of the Rockaways fought hard for the existing bus stops and service. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The MTA should prove that there is low demand for bus service via Newport Avenue by doing a comparative valuation and community benefit analysis. This would factor operating costs and ridership. 
but it would also quantitatively evaluate the people who would have their walking distance increase and decrease, travel times increase and decrease, tran transfers added and reduced. This would determine the final benefit score. The higher the final benefit score, the greater the net community benefit. This would al should also be done in tandem with a Title VI analysis. The QM3 may have low ridership now, but this could change when congestion pricing is implemented. Should the QM3 still have low ridership as per the MT and New York City Transit Service Guidelines Manual with documentation, then it could be eliminated. The QM3 may also be saved and could be more productive if it would, instead of Midtown Manhattan, operate to downtown Manhattan, as at the Long Island Railroad Port Washington branch already serves Midtown Manhattan and operates near Northern Boulevard, rerouting the QM3 to downtown Manhattan would give Northeastern Queens additional travel options. We must all work together to have better bus service for Queens. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Nuremberg, followed by Lisa Daglian. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Nuremberg, the Vice President of Passengers United. And we have some good news about the F train, the 63rd Street branch is finally being reopened in April. That's great. But we did learn something from this whole project, and that is the F train has actually been experiencing better service based on reports that we've been getting on 53rd Street. And that raises the question, we, and uh, many others have echoed the same question as well. Would the subways be running better if the F and the M were swapped? So the F would be going on 53rd Street, and the M would be going on 63rd and Roosevelt Island. So. We would actually support this, and here's why we would support this. First of all, the tracks at 36th Street on uh, Queens Boulevard were actually meant for this anyway. The, there would be no slow zone because the F would be already on the express track. We would have the M coming from the tracks already, so they're already designed for that. So we would have a slow zone eliminated. We would have, and as a result, we would actually have increased trains per hour. And this is actually something that other people have started a petition for. There's a growing movement. Not only would this increase the frequencies along the branch, but also it would it expand access to Western Queens from Roosevelt Island. And this might sound like a lot to you all, but in actuality, I really think this is something that I really hope the MTA has been considering and discussing, especially with the re uh, restoration of Roosevelt Island service and through service along 63rd Street. So I'm going to echo support for that, and that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian, followed by Jason Anthony. Hi, good morning. I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. It's terrific to see some new faces around the table. Welcome. You've come aboard at a critical time. A historic vote is planned for Wednesday, which will bring us another step closer to congestion pricing. It's a day we've been waiting for since, since the law was passed in 2019. Don't let the grumblers get to you. They're the same people who complain loudest if the system starts to decay and, reliably, and reliability declines. Instead, this is an opportunity to look forward to all the ways to invest in riders. That means ensuring that service and frequency continue to improve. We're so glad that our Albany electeds continue to focus on the needs of transit and the millions of riders who rely on it. It means moving forward with the bus redesigns and with pursuing more bus lanes and busways so we finally see speeds on these engines of equities that are faster than a chicken. It means continuing to focus on safety in the system, both the reality and perception for both riders and transit workers. Addressing the needs of the mentally ill through the SCOUT program with increased supportive services and enforcement abilities should get more people with serious mental, in serious need of help the care they need before they harm themselves or others. Having NYPD leadership ride trains to experience firsthand what strap hangers do may, help direct, may better help direct resources. Collaboration among levels of law enforcement and the MTA will help identify recidivists across boroughs. And ensuring that there are tough consequences for anyone who harms a transit worker and adding cameras to more quickly catch them will help protect those on who we rely every day. Congestion pricing will help get more people on board some who may not have ridden since COVID. To them, we say welcome back. The more riders, the better for all of us. The region's future depends on a strong transit system. 
including all of its all-stars here today. Thank you so much. Making sure all the pieces are in place starts in this room. Thank you. Our last public speaker is Jason Anthony. Uh, good morning, Reg. Good morning, Heida. And thank you, Lucille, for introducing me. The best for last. Buenos dias. Uh, news flash. Uh, as of, let's say, as of 1043, we receive uh, good news uh, for our brothers and sisters for the disability community. Uh, our beloved Senator Chuck Schumer announced for the fiscal year 2024 TDOT operation, uh, operations bill included funds that will make the class and avenue station on the G line are fully accessible. So this means that one more station on the Crosstown line will be uh, fully accessible under this uh, operations bill. But those who are in the transit committee have one thing to do this Wednesday, vote for congestion pricing. We know that a certain person on the other side of the Hudson was a bully to yours truly in his remarks that sounded offensive. But guess what? Yours truly will be a full supporter of congestion pricing. It will continue to do so. But I'm not going to pressure you guys to vote either yes or no. But vote with your conscience. But having in mind, remember those with disabilities, elderly, and low-income folks. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Chair, that concludes public comment. Thank you, too. Thank you to all our public speakers. Before we move on with uh, today's business, I just want to welcome our newest board members, Mira Joshi and Brian Herbs, and welcome back, Sammy. Oh, uh, Brian, Mark. Uh, yeah, I have Brian Herbs. I, I worked with the Brian Herbs. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, Brian, if you're listening. Anyway, but um, welcome to you all. I'm looking forward to making um, uh, our job here at the MTA uh, that much better. And also to wish uh, Patrick Warren a... Uh, I guess uh, good luck on your next adventure, I should say. Go back to Washington. We're going to miss you, Pat. It was, you were one of the first um, people that I met here when I started uh, my journey at the MTA back in 2019. But wish you all um, the best. Wish you the best. All right. Rich, ready? Yes. Um, are there changes to the work plan? Uh, oh, before that, we yes. need a motion to accept the uh, minutes for February 2nd. All those in favor? Against? Thank you. Um, changes to the work plan? Yes, the EO plan for 2023 will be presented in April instead of this month, Chair. Great. Move on with the President's report. Great. Thank you, Heda, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our new members as well. Uh, and to Pat, I uh, will let me echo uh, that. Um, headed off to the NTSB. As you will know, we hope to never see you again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christmas parties. Don't take that person. <laughs> no, we will miss him for sure. Um, March has been a busy month in New York City Transit. Today we will review the month uh, as it was with a special focus on Transit Employee Appreciation Day. We know that transit safety and the safety of our workforce is top of mind right now. And uh, we'll spend some time today talking about what we're doing, also with our partners in law enforcement, uh, Chief Kemper is here as well, uh, who will talk a little bit about all the work uh, that we're doing together to keep our customers and our employees safe. So this past Monday was National Transit Worker Appreciation Day, celebrated all across the country. Every day I am humbled to lead this 47,000 person team and was proud to spend the entire day out in the field with the men and women of New York City Transit. Over the course of the day, I had a chance to visit over a dozen employee facilities, starting at the Michael J. Quill Depot before the sun rose and ending with a pizza dinner at the Consolidator Revenue Facility as the evening shift began. Visiting our team in the field offers a constant reminder of the care, creativity, and commitment of our team. To that end, I'm also proud to announce that we're launching a first-of-its-kind employee innovation competition, the North Star Challenge. 
We have more to share in this in the months ahead, but I'm excited to see the ideas of the team on how we can improve safety, raise customer satisfaction, and improve uh, our operational efficiencies. I was also able to spend some time out in the field shadowing conductor Courtney Williams on his way um, uh, around my home line, the seven. Seeing him up close and the job he did, has been doing for the last 21 years, was a reminder at the extraordinary work that our, cust uh, our conductors are doing. By the way, their jobs are not in jeopardy because I was barely passable. Demetrius and Frank, however, also stepped into the mix. Um, in their team's shoes, with Demetrius donning the yellow vest and working as a station agent out of the booth, congratulations, and Frank doing some early morning maintenance at Quill. As you can see, we did time him changing this windshield wiper blade. How long? Well, let's just say the bus never made it out. No, uh, he did can a good job. Can change a yeah. diaper quickly? Yeah, he, probably, he probably can. Now it is a new grandfather. And then, of course, you know, not to be outdone, Chair and CEO Channel Lieber also shadowed several members of our station teams at Grand Central working with our cleaners um, and also uh, seeing firsthand what our platform controllers are doing to keep our customers safe and the trains moving on crowded platforms. In particular, on the 7 line, we have an enormous amount of work happening. And as folks know, the 7 line uh, is uh, incredibly busy during the work week. So we all came together ultimately as the MTA family that afternoon for an all-agency press event to celebrate the members of our team who had a chance we, to work alongside. We also uh, participated in a national video. So this was not just a... Uh, a day that we celebrated, but it was a day across the United States to uh, to recognize uh, the amazing work that our transit folks do. And I'm told I have the power to do that, I guess. Hey, thank you guys for riding to RTC Las Vegas, Nevada. And don't forget to thank your operators. Viva Las Vegas! Welcome to Boston. Hi, I'm from San Diego. So thanks to our team members and for every transit worker across the United States for moving our cities and our nation. Um, appreciating our employees also means keeping them safe. And our frontline workers, station agents, cleaners, bus operators, conductors, for example, perform critical frontline jobs. And none should entail fearing for one's safety. Last Tuesday, Jano and I were up in the Bronx once again for a hearing of Alexander Wright, a recidivist criminal who assaulted our station cleaner, Anthony Nelson, 18 months ago. His case is still working through its way through court. And we have stood by Anthony and his family every step of the way, as we will to the end of the case. The good news is that assaults on our workers are down 26% 26, 26 so far in 2024. However, every incident is one too many. And events like the slashing, the awful slashing of conductor Alton Scott on the job on the A train of Brooklyn a few weeks ago are unacceptable acts of violence that must be stopped. Frontline workers like Conductor Scott deserve to come to work every day and be safe on our job. We will continue to push the criminal justice system, including the district attorneys, to ensure that justice is delivered, particularly for those recidivists who prey upon transit workers. February, uh, February and March have also seen strong ridership growth, especially on subways and paratransit. On average, subway ridership is consistently above where it was the same time last year, and I'm confident these trends will continue, especially as spring comes and New York, springs, New York City springs alive. One fun fact from February was that the evening rush hour on Valentine's Day, we had the highest ridership hour on the subway since the pandemic. Love was apparently in the air on the subway system. And on paratransit, you'll hear from Chris a little later on the incredible work being done to raise the bar on performance and satisfaction. Obviously, some of our customers spoke earlier, and as I always say, you know, their uh, daily experience uh, is to be acknowledged and we want to improve. Uh, but I do want to give a special shout out for the consistency of Chris and his team for setting ridership records and customer satisfaction. 
Last Friday, uh, Demetrius was on scene at Ozone Park and Lefferts Boulevard to unveil new plaques celebrating the community of Little Guyana. Commemorations like this demonstrate the essential role our subway stations serve in communities across New York City and thrilled that we were able to honor New York's over 140,000 uh, Guyanese Americans on their first uh, day of the Holy Festival. Readers of the Weekend Times will, should not only have seen one, but two major, uh, actually three major, or two major New York City transit features in recent weeks, both which uh, demonstrate the team that make faster, cleaner, and safer possible. First, in February 25th, we all learned that Weekend Czar, Service Czar, Jose LaSalle's Sunday routine. Unlike me, where I get to sleep in, maybe I go to the gym, probably eat uh, breakfast. He uh, spends his Sundays, as you all know, working hard so that millions of New Yorkers can enjoy the city and get around as seamlessly as possible. We've heard at this very committee about the incredible work Jose and his team has done and the immense progress we've had to deliver better service on the weekends while doing uh, immense capital work. And second, uh, we got some well-deserved love from the New York Times as well on March 1st, a remarkable uh, photographic series showing our two largest subway car overhaul shops at 207 Street Yard in Coney Island, where the magic happens to keep you know, some of our newest cars that are weeks old out there and some of cars that are over 50 years old out moving our system. And speaking of subway car overhauls, if you were lucky enough to watch New York One today, you would have seen a well-deserved feature on the person who runs those shops, our trailblazing vice president of car equipment and chief mechanical officer, Sue Co. Sue is the first woman ever to hold this title in, New York, in the Department of Subways, where she oversees 13 yards, two overhaul shops, and 6,500 subway cars, one of the largest fleets in the world. She has broken barriers during her 37-year career here, and she is currently spearheading major initiatives like bringing the R211s in and the fleet-wide deployment of camera. She embodies faster, cleaner, safer, and can think of no uh, person more deserving, particularly this month as Women's History Month, uh, to acknowledge Sue Co and the tremendous work she does. Fortunately, she's not here. I think she's repairing some of those old cars herself, which she typically does. Um, you know, and throughout March, we've been celebrating Women's History Month at New York City Transit. Earlier this month, our peers, the Transit Museum, celebrated the trailblazer Marion McAllister, who became the first female train operator in 1973. In the decade since, I'm proud that New York City Transit has changed immeasurably in the 51 years since, with women moving New York in roles up and down this organization, including two women presidents and SVP of Subways, and women currently serving in numerous senior leadership positions, but we have work to do. Last week, we also celebrated Women's History Month where our Empowering Women in Transportation ERG group at their annual Empower Her Celebration Awards. I want to congratulate all the New York City Transit honorees uh, on that day. I wanted to devote the last portion of my update this month to discuss safety. It's one of our uh, top priorities, and for me, when I joined New York City Transit now about two years ago, I articulated it as job one and priority one for us, and being a core component of our faster, cleaner, and safer plan. Simply put, customers and employees alike must feel safe and must be safe in our system. In every monthly survey that we uh, have had, our subway customers tell us that safety and quality of life concerns are their core drivers of their satisfaction and their potential to ride more. In March, Governor Hochul and Chair Lieber announced a five-point plan to address these safety concerns, including a focus on mental health outreach, engaging with the criminal justice system to ensure justice is delivered to those who dare prey on our customers and workers, new cameras for subway conductors to keep them safe, additional employment of uh, uniformed personnel, and uh, uh, supporting the NYPD scaled up bag checks. We're also doing our part to make improvements to customer and employee safety. On buses, we are, starting today, debuting a pilot pro program for real-time camera displays. These screens will feed real-time footage from the existing robust network of bus cameras to conspicuously reinforce to passengers as they board that they are, in fact, on camera. By the end of the year, the displays will be piloted on about 100 buses, and we will monitor customer and operator sentiment and safety metrics for potential expansion. For those who want a sneak peek, we have a demonstration bus from Tuskegee downstairs out in front of 2 Broadway with the very first panel installed. In the subway system, I think it's notable that customers say it is literally in every month person, in every monthly pulse survey that they want to see more uniformed officers in our system. It is no surprise that February 2023, uh, a month with both extremely strong uh, on-time performance and a surge 
uh, of NYPD, we saw the highest customer satisfaction score at 65%. This is last year. For those reasons, we are grateful to see the governor and the mayor both deploying additional uniform personnel in the subway, especially our partners at NYPD who have surged an additional 1,000 cops underground over the last month and a half. I take the system every day, and I've seen a tangible increase in the presence of officers from platforms, trains, and throughout our stations. Their omnipresence is crucial to our customers. One thing I want to talk a little bit about, uh, but I know will be discussed at length at the board meeting on Wednesday, is one part of the governor's five-point plan, which I am especially excited about, which is the expansion of our scout teams, uh, piloting two units uh, to ten. You know, people behaving erratically has been the number one issue that our customers have told us that on the subway is the most challenging, the thing that they care about and are concerned about the most. A lot of folks who have acute mental health crises happening in our system are not violent, um, but you don't know. Um, you know, getting on a train and doing your own risk assessment and seeing a per per person who might have, you know, that kind of acute mental health crisis, you do not know what's happening to them. So getting the scout teams and being able to move folks into the services that they need, which is not jail, uh, but hospitalization, medication, the kinds of services are critically important. We've already seen some success there. And as I said, the board will get a full briefing uh, on Wednesday. But we are excited to see this program uh, continuing. Uh, and then lastly, I'd be remiss not to mention this past month, although there have been several high-profile incidents, including the slashing of our conductors I mentioned and the terrible shooting at Hoyt Skimmerhorn, you know, these incidents have a disproportionate impact, I think, on the sense of safety uh, for both our employees and our customers. Gun violence is unconscionable, and something else we need to do is to get guns out of our subway system. But I want to emphasize, and I know Chief Kemper will shortly, um, you know, we are working tirelessly to improve safety in our system and are working hand in glove with the chief who we and his team, who we have incredible uh, confidence in, uh, to move our customers and our employees safely every day. So with that, Chair, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Rich. Any questions for Rich? If not, are we going to move on to Chief Kempler or are we going to do Q first? We're actually going to have Chris uh, Pangolini oh, do Chris, a short I'm presentation sorry, on paratransit. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. All right. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Pangolini, uh, lead accessoride here at MTA. Um, great to be back here to talk about our service. So uh, on this presentation, there's a few takeaways I would like to leave with you all here and listed here. Um, uh, first, I'm going to start with a review of what paratransit and accessoride is, because I think that's important to set the stage of where we're going uh, to talk about who our customers are, our, our customer satisfaction, but acknowledging also that there are areas of improvement that we need to work on, um, and then some of the initiatives that we're taking on. And finally, I will conclude with uh, some great news about Omni for accessoride. Okay, so uh, what is paratransit? So paratransit service, which is what we provide at Accessoride, uh, was mandated under the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, and transit agencies across the United States are required to provide this service. Its original intent back in 1990 was to serve as a, quote, safety net for individuals who, because of their disabilities, are unable to use fixed route service, such as the bus or subway here in New York. And we do this by moving people on paratransit through either our blue and white vans, which we call our dedicated service, as well as through uh, yellow cabs and for hire vehicles, which is our broker service. And we take reservations over the phone, as well as through our Accessoride MyMTA app. Now, I mentioned the word safety net earlier, which was what Accessoride was started out as. But I think what we've seen that even though we have been able to meet this definition of a safety net um, and also a shared ride, quote unquote, not a taxi service, as the, as the ADA says, there's a clear need to go above and beyond these minimum requirements. Uh, and agencies, including the MTA, are recognizing that these requirements might not be enough for many of our customers who travel more often or who, who need the reliability, uh, flexibility, and spontaneity in order to live their lives and access all the opportunities that the city has to offer. So before I get into what that evolving mission is, I want to take a quick uh, reflection of where we are today. 
And so on the left here are the ADA um, minimum requirements for paratransit, and the yellow there is what we provide. And, it, and the ADA covers a number of factors. I, I show five here, including service area, uh, hours and days of uh, service, uh, reservation windows, the fare, and then the big one that, um, that all agencies have to make sure they hit is this idea, what's is called absence of capacity constraints, which is that when somebody wants to travel on Accessoride or paratransit anywhere in the United States, that they are allowed to uh, in reason when they want to. And the way that we measure that, and this is why you see this in your uh, board packet every month, is the idea of on-time performance, provider no-shows, uh, what we call a maximum ride time, as well as the ease of making a reservation for paratransit. So these are some key factors that are very important to our customers, as well as us and our federal regulators. And I am happy to report that in February, we did, even though we made the um, window tighter than 30 minutes, it's down to 20 minutes now, we are at 92% for the month of February. Um, our no-shows are a third of our goal, which is fantastic, less than one per 1,000. Uh, we are about 99% with our max ride time and our call time, uh, in other words, the average uh, time to answer your call for a reservation is down to 17 seconds, with our goal being 60. So we're very, very fast. And this is also in addition to the My AAR app, when you can book a trip online um, at your fingertips. So who are our customers? Who rides Accessoride? So in our last uh, survey uh, of our customers in the fall, we found that medical trips are the primary purpose for Accessoride travel, with 84% using Accessoride for some kind of medical trip. Um, they will also, so these don't have to 100% because people, of course, have multiple purposes. Uh, the 46%, the so about half of our customers also use Accessoride for personal errands, perhaps going to church um, or going to a senior center or something like that. Another 40% for shopping, and then you see work and school being rounding out the main purposes for Accessoride use. What's also interesting is that if you look at our number of customers and the, how often they travel, so we have about 175,000 customers re registered um, uh, right now. So in, if we looked at their trip patterns in the uh, last year, 2023, nearly 40% of our customers actually did not take a ride in 2023. So of the 60% that did take a ride, the vast majority, 79%, average about two trips a month. Um, and they, take, and they um, account for about 30% of all trips. But we also have a very, on the other end, a very active cohort of customers. Only 7% of our customers, but they take 51% of all Accessoride trips. And what I think is really interesting about this is the way that we looked at our customers is that, you know, it's not a monolithic group. You don't, it's not, an, it's not one group of Accessoride customers. There are people who use it very often and rely on it for uh, daily or weekly medical trips as well as work or social outings, you know, anything else that somebody would use the subway or bus for. But there's also people, the vast majority of our customers actually, that ride very occasionally. And so what this tells us is that there's actually, you know, different customers with very different needs on Accessoride, which would um, entail different um, types, of, uh, types of solutions to, to make them satisfied. So what we've seen over the last four years since, the, uh, since 2020 is our ridership really returning. Uh, 2023 almost eclipsed our last high, but 2024 is on pace right now to eclipse the uh, previous high set in 2019. And we're seeing more customers now, and all of our, also our existing customers are riding more often. Now, despite the huge increase in ridership, we have been able to uh, maintain a higher level of customer satisfaction. In fact, in February, we hit our next high of 80%, our latest high of 80% customer satisfaction. And a lot of this was due to an increase in on-time performance, an increase in driver, driver helpfulness, as well as an increase in the ability to make phone and online reservations. Now, of course, this is not to say that we're perfect by any means. We still have 20% that are not satisfied and a good number in the red there that are very unsatisfied. And so we must work to, main, to, uh, to convert those into our blue and green categories. So some of the initi initiatives here that help move the needle here is working with our transportation providers and as well as our call center staff to implement a 20 minute on-time performance window as well as reduce the provider no-shows to below 0.3% or three per 1,000 trips. So I don't know if you remember two years ago or even a year ago when we were still coming out of the supply constraints from the pandemic, this was very tough to hit, but now we have been regularly hitting this the last six months and it's really starting to show in the customer satisfaction. Um, we've also made numerous improvements in the online booking experience um, as well as I'll show you a couple of other things here that have helped us uh, bring our, um, or accommodate a 23% increase in demand. So in terms of our uh, reservations, um, this on the left here is a graph over the last um, about 18 months or so 
of the use of the online booking tool. And it's gone from just under 6% to over uh, 13% now. Um, and so while our scheduled trips have increased by almost 25% in the last year, our planning calls have only increased by 13%. So a lot of people are making their reservations now by the phone. And this has been huge for our customers, as, I, as you saw earlier, in improving their customer experience, but also been a cost savings for the MTA as people have been booking trips online. Um, so this one's a little wonky, but I wanted to show you guys because this is like a, this really gets at the heart of an Accessoride user's experience. So th what, these are two graphs, a before and after, and the way that it works is the FTA and the um, ADA allow trans agencies to negotiate plus or minus one hour from when somebody wants to travel. So for example, if someone wants to travel at 9 a.m., trans agencies can offer between 8 to 10 a.m. as a pickup time. So on the left, you'll see about half of our trips were exactly when people wanted to get picked up. But uh, the other half were plus or minus one to 30 minutes before we made this change. Today, over 90% of trips people request are exactly when they want to travel. So this is way above and beyond what was originally envisioned for paratransit. And I'm really proud of our team at Accessoride for being able to make this happen. And so far, it's working out OK. Um, the, the, the fear here is, of course, if you make everybody allow them to travel when they want, you might run out of capacity. But so far, so good with what we're, we're seeing here. This, has been, this, this used to be a big uh, point of contention with customers who couldn't get the time that they wanted to travel. Um, and one more I wanted to show here is an increase in efficiency over the last uh, eight years or so. The blue is our share of blue and white vans, and the yellow is the share of taxis and for hire vehicles. And a lot of trips have shifted from uh, the blue and white vans to the taxis and for hire vehicles over the last eight years, and we're now over 70% on the blue and uh, sorry on the uh, for hire vehicles and taxis. And what that has helped do is it's given a, a lot of our customers prefer that mode and that they can get a sedan or, a, or an SUV to travel in uh, as opposed to a blue and white van. Of course, our blue and white vans will always be available for those who need it or, or prefer it. Um, and what, what this has also allowed us to do is increase our cost efficiency. So the black line is our cost per trip in 2023 dollars. And it's actually come down since 2015 from over $70 to just under $60 today per trip. So it, despite having a growth in ridership, um, we've actually been able to reduce our cost uh, basis. Now, like I said earlier, this doesn't mean we're perfect. We have a lot of areas that we want to improve on, and as, as our uh, public speakers have pointed out, some of these areas as well. And so meeting, I, I meet monthly with our advocates and our uh, customers and, and our uh, paratransit advisory committee, and, and we're, of course, reviewing complaints and other feedback. Um, and so these are some of the areas here that we've cited for improvement this year and, and ongoing, including driver training and communications, the length of a shared ride trip, um, being uh, adjusting the early, uh, sorry, the appointment time drop off so they're not so early, uh, always improving on time performance, uh, evolving the e hail on demand program, and continuing to improve our online, our online booking. So I'm not going to read this entire slide to you here, but this is essentially our roadmap of where we want to be going over the next two years to address numerous areas. And at the bottom there, you'll see the big one, which is the paratransit software system upgrade. Um, and we're getting that RFP out very soon, hopefully within the month, uh, within the next month here. And that program, once we uh, get out in the street, get some bids, and, and then eventually select a new vendor, uh, will be huge because technology today runs transportation and technology uh, that we want to upgrade to will help us accomplish a lot of our goals that I just mentioned, including many of these areas here on, on the slide, um, such as on-time performance and, and flexibility. Um, lastly, I want to conclude by just talking about a big rollout that we've had here in March and continues to roll out. Um, you know, Omni has been available for our fixed route customers for the last several years, offering that convenience of tap and go on the bus and subway. Uh, so we rolled out uh, this month with 86 customers uh, on Accessoride, the ability to get an Omni ID, as you can see in the top there with, a, with their photo. Um, and this Omni ID will combine three features of Accessorite into one. So they'll have their Accessorite ID as their Omni card. They'll be able to use their Omni online account for cashless payment in an Accessorite vehicle, so no more using cash to pay the driver. And they can also use their Omni card if they've made a request for this for a free fare on the bus and subway if they wanted to use the fixed route system instead of uh, paratransit. And uh, this is very exciting because it really does make it a lot easier for customers to, to pay for Accessoride and use the fixed route system. 
Um, and the reason why we're doing this rollout slower, slower is because we want to be able to identify and address any technical issues before we do a wider rollout. So we'll be evaluating this program with our 86 customers who we've um, had many meetings with. They're going to give us a lot of feedback on this. We want to make mistakes. We want to find bugs. That's the whole point of this rollout. Um, and as we, as we smooth those out, we will then expand the rollout to more and more customers. Um, so as I leave you here with our vision, I do want to thank uh, the Accessoride team at 3300 Northern Boulevard and out in the field who've been doing a lot of work with our providers on, on, on site and uh, you know, as secret shoppers, making sure that our service is at, to, at our standard and, and making recommendations to improve it. Um, also, our, our vendors who provide our service, we've been working hard. We, we ride them very hard, but we, we do it for a reason, which is to improve our service. Um, and, of course, all of our partners here at MTA, including Q and his team at System-Wide Accessibility, for all the input that they've had in our vision and, and the Omni uh, rollout. Um, and, of course, our teams at, at IT and procurement and legal and others here at MTA. Um, you know, paratransit uh, is, it, it, you know, it touches everyone at MTA, touches a lot of our contractors, um, and it really takes a full team to make this happen every day, day in and day out. So very grateful to be part of this team and to... Um, to achieve what we've achieved so far, but we know we have a, a long ways to go to continue improving. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the very extensive presentation. Any questions for Chris? Okay, if not, we move on to Chief Kempler. Welcome, Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. It's that time. I just looked at the clock. It's, it's 5 to 12. It's like, uh, is it morning or afternoon yet? So whatever you call it, good. Uh, Chair Mahalsis, uh, President Davey, and uh, to all members of the board. Uh, the transit system has seen an increased deployment since the beginning of February, starting with the infusion of additional uniform officers directed by Mayor Adams and Police Commissioner Caban. Over this past month, we've coordinated with the MTA Police, New York State Police, and National Guard regarding deployment, with the ultimate goal of expanding the security footprint and increasing uniform presence. When it comes to the NYPD, we've maintained the surge of uniform officers into the subway, deploying upwards of 1,000 additional officers each day since the beginning of February. These cops are out there and highly visible, deployed to the turnstiles, on subway platforms, and inside moving trains. This investment of officers continues to pay dividends. For context, at the end of January, we saw a concerning 46.7% increase in overall crime in the subway system. This prompted the city and NYPD leadership to infuse the system with the investment I just mentioned. And by the end of February, we narrowed this increase down to 12.5% year to date. I could say that now that as of today, we've closed this gap even further to a 4.4% increase year to date. Since the surge of additional uniform officers into the subway in the first week of February, overall crime in the transit system is down 14% over the last seven and a half week period. In fact, so far, for the month of March alone, and as of right now, today, overall crime is down 15.5% in March. This is progress, and this is a trend we are working very hard at continuing. That being said, while the statistics indicate that crime is trending downward, we did experience some unfortunate, high-profile incidents that weigh heavily on our riders' minds, and understandably so. Make no mistake about it, we are focused on the task at hand, and we are committed to preventing acts like that from ever happening again. Your cops are out there, working hard and addressing rider concerns around the clock. Public safety is our top priority and officers are focused on confronting lawlessness head on. All categories of enforcement are up or at, ne at or near historic highs. Year to date, there have been nearly 4,500 arrests made in the subway system. This is a 53.6% increase versus last year. Tab summonses are up 25.7% 25 with over 45,000 issues so far this year. We've continued our emphasis on confronting fare evasion with over 31,400 fare evasion contacts so far this year. This is a 10% increase from last year. We've recovered 19 guns, which is more than double the number we've recovered last year to date. And we've made over 430 arrests for other weapons in the system, which is a 71.4% increase. However, a challenge that we continue to face is that of criminal recidivism. For example, 
Let's take a look at a crime that affects most in this room. Assaults against, M assaults against MTA employees. Last year, 38 individuals were arrested for 41 complaints of assaults on MTA workers. Those 38 individuals have been arrested a combined total of 1,126 times. The job of moving four plus million subway riders a day is no easy task. An MTA employee should be able to come to work, carry out that vital mission without being subject to acts of violence. But when these arrests are made, there needs to be consequences. Where is the deterrence without consequences? Where is the justice for our victims? Know this. Your cops are also out there working hard and holding those who commit crimes against our riders accountable. But we find ourselves arresting the same people over and over again. We'll call them repeat offenders. Again, let's look at last year as an example. In 2023, NYPD cops made over 13,600 arrests in the subway system. 124 of those individuals were arrested five or more times in the subway system last year alone. When looking even further, these 124 people alone, when combined, total over 7,500 arrests in their lifetime. How is this happening? Look, when it comes to discussions about the criminal justice system, the NYPD is always out front and held to account. And we both welcome that and pride ourselves on that. But we must also look to the other stakeholders in the criminal justice system. Prosecutors, judges, city and state lawmakers, whose decisions, in large part, determine the outcomes and consequences for every arrest we make, and whose decisions have far-reaching impact on the safety of the subway system. In my tenure as the Chief of Transit, I've come to know many of those who are in this boardroom right now. We've stood shoulder to shoulder at critical scenes. We've had heartfelt conversations about achievements and challenges and had meetings to discuss how we can provide a better experience for our riders. The relationships built here are so important to our collective goal of delivering riders to their des destinations quickly and safely. I've said this many times before in this room, your transit cops are second to none. They are dedicated to the mission of public safety, subway safety. They've rescued riders who have fallen onto the tracks, given doses of life-saving Narcan to a person in need, confronted those who'd bring disorder into our subways, but also simply said hello to a rider on, who's on their journey, offering them a sense of comfort and safety. There's a lot of good that has been done over the last few months as we hone in on the issues that weigh on our riders' minds. We've recognized there is still a lot to accomplish, but we are committed to capitalizing on this momentum, addressing crime and quality of life conditions, all with the goal of it making every rider feel safe. I welcome our continued partnership, and I'll gladly take any questions or comments anyone may have. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief, for that very comprehensive report. And um, I think everyone in this boardroom agrees with you on all the points that you made. Um, one question I had, um, NYPD working with Scout, or is that just MTA police? So um, we have our own uh, subway safety uh, uh, plan, and we do have um, units, uh, if you will, that uh, work alongside our partners, uh, you know, in, uh, DHS, uh, DOHMH, uh, very similar work where we go out seven days a week. Uh, yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Andrew? Let me start by thanking you, Chief, and all your people for the amazing work yeah. that you're doing out there. I've seen more and more officers. But I wanted to ask you, since you brought up the issue of recidivism and how many how few people are committing such a large number of crimes. Can those be looped into one geographic area or one uh, judicial area, for instance? Is it, a, is it a, a judge that's letting these folks go, or is it, is it a multitude of, of issues that's having them released? That's multiple, and, and that encompasses uh, you know, the entire city. Um, and I'd like to say those arrest numbers are just New York City arrests. So I'd venture to say that 
uh, there's even more arrests when you look at uh, out of New York City and out of state. So, so to answer your question, that <laughs> encompasses the entire city. And let me be clear, uh, you know, this isn't just a, uh, uh, you know, about a individual prosecutor or prosecutor or judges. This is collectively. Uh, this is collectively. Um, and I, I think I've been very vocal on this. And again, I'm here right now. I say this all the time. Where are they? And where are the questions coming their way? And where is the accountability? And let's have an honest conversation. And I think the, uh, the camera system that we've got and are still developing has solved so many crimes so mm -hmm. fast, yeah. even crimes that didn't start in the yeah. subway, but the perpetrator ran down in the subway and they caught his image. So, um, Andrew, you put a smile on my face when you said that. I love the, uh, I love the camera system. I'm a uh, staunch supporter of it. I speak about it all the time. Tremendous value, uh, crime-wise, uh, you know, uh, uh, preventing crime, you know, w w as a deterrent, and certainly the value of it, uh, uh, you know, if something does occur, and also, uh, we use those cameras not only for crime. Uh, you know, we use those cameras if there's a missing child, uh, if there's uh, questions, if we're looking for something. Uh, we use that uh, proactively and reactively. So there's so much value, and, you know, every day it seems like it's expanding, and I'm excited uh, about the uh, cameras being installed in, inside the trains. Thank you. Any other questions for Chief? If not, Chief, thank you, and uh, keep up the great work. Um, we're you're welcome. We're now going to hear from Q. Thank you so much, Chairman Halters. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, if you heard me at this morning railroads committee, uh, we're going to keep on this theme of the definition of accessibility beyond elevators and, and ramps elevators and escalators. We talk a lot about elevators, openings, and vertical access, but there's so much more that goes into accessibility. Today, I am excited to report on progress on tactile warning strips, those bump yellow tiles placed on the edge of the subway platforms. You may not notice them, but tactile warnings are one of the most important accessibility features to our low vision and blind customers and are a perfect example of universal benefits of accessible design. Those bright yellow warning strips help all of our customers stay safe on the platform and we're working to get them installed system-wide as quickly and as efficiently as we can. A few, years, a few years ago, we did a proof of concept where we tested out new materials for tactile warning, including ones that could be installed faster, basically applying them on top of existing platforms where conditions allowed rather than waiting for capital projects to come and rip up the platforms and, and would require full reconstruction as the only way to install tactile strips. After we tried many new materials, we found some that worked and a method that was comfortable with our infrastructure capital construction team at Subways, short for ICC, to go to work. And they've been full steam ahead on this project ever since. Over the course of the last two years, ICC has installed tactile strips at 54 platform edges, leveraging weekend work and other projects to get this safety and accessibility feature in place. We've made big progress with the installation of tactile strips at those platforms and across 25 stations a project that ICC completed earlier this year and will continue to tackle the remaining work through our capital plan. I want to send a huge thank you to our subway colleagues for their commitment to this work and for finding innovative ways to do it faster. Thanks to the ICC team that made this happen, including the team here behind me today. I want to call out a couple of folks in the team, Superintendent Michael Paccarella from MS2, Pino Garolino, uh, uh, MS1, Donald, Godolfo, uh, Odelli Ennis, Lawrence Conway, uh, maintainer, maintainers Chris Box, and John, uh, Josh Bangaroo. Thank you so much for your work. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Dee. And a huge shout out for Chris. Thank you so much for all the enhancement happening out of paratransit. The app has been working great. We have a lot of people testing that app, using it. The Gripes love it. There are barometers. <laughs> and, 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 and thank you, Chris, for, for all the enhancements that you mentioned earlier today. Uh, really great work at paratransit. And, and, and thank you so much. Any questions for Q? None? All right. Well, thank you, Q, and to the hardworking gentlemen and ladies that uh, help you do your job every day. Uh, we'll now move on 
to Rich and our uh, Transit All-Stars. Transit All-Stars, yes. Before we do that, speaking of apps, we are also pleased to announce that our MTA app, uh, we've launched today a new update uh, to the MTA app. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. Live bus tracking uh, has improved, service alerts as well, um, and then getting push alerts about service changes. So we want to get customer feedback. Um, welcome to the new app, see look at that. Uh, so please continue to give us feedback. Uh, we will continue to make changes and improvements, but we're delighted to see that. Speaking of delighted, we have 11 Transit All-Stars we want to recognize today. I'm going to say maybe hold our applause till the end, and we have a photographer, I hope. I hope. I hope. Um, you know, each month, even though this is Transit Worker Appreciation Month, we're looking to acknowledge um, a number of employees who move our service every day. And, and I do mean it when I say, and I know Frank and Chris and Demetrius and the senior leadership team, Sarah, uh, really you know, have em embraced the 47,000 men and women who make us look good every day. Um, so we want to honor a few folks. Uh, we're honoring five members of the Subway Speed Unit, uh, which stands for Subway Performance Evaluation, Education, and Development. Uh, their mission involves testing uh, train speeds in nearly every uh, track of, of, uh, uh, of subways to make sure that we're running as quickly and as safely as we can. So, uh, and then a few other folks as well. So first off, we have Director John Villanueva. John, he actively participates in the CBTC projects and collaborates with various departments within transit regarding uh, investigations and reenactments. We ex ex um, commend John for exemplary leadership. John, give us a, just a wave. Thank you. Next, we have another member of the speed team, train service supervisor, uh, Anthony Perlato. During his tenure, he successfully implemented and participated in over 4,000 signal tests and implemented 400 hundred speed increases. What does that mean? If you're on our subway, you're getting there a little faster, uh, thanks to him. Train supervisor, uh, Fidelis Casado, another original member, original member of the speed team. It's like, like the Bee Gees or something, or the original member of the Beatles. Uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge from his experience in various subway operational units, including service delivery, ops training, and ops support. Uh, train sup uh, service supervisor Shaquana Mills, since joining in 2022, she has contributed significantly to the Department of Subway's commitment to on-time performance improvements, which has remained on or above 83% since 2002. Train service supervisor Tyrone Bain, our last speed unit all-star, is being honored today for keenly observing the impactful efforts of the unit from signal recalibration to the education and development of operating personnel. Let's give the speed uh, team a round of applause. Well done. Uh, then we have analyst Max Diamond. I mean, talk about a great last name. As part of Subway's performance uh, anal analysis unit, he takes pride in the team's efforts to undertake the most significant overhaul of operating speeds in 60 years. He's also a variety of experience within transits and ops planning and as a conductor um, and now in PAU. We also want to introduce bus operator Frederick Burchell from the Queens Village Depot. He is more than a great a bus driver. He's the type of person who goes above and beyond for people just because he cares. Recently, he went viral on social media for helping a customer in need on Instagram. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do it. Sometimes there are snarky posts on social media, mostly about me, which is probably deserving. But um, our folks go above and beyond, and he was caught doing some amazing things. Um, Frederick, where are you, by the way? Please give us the, you are in the back. Of course you are. Hiding. Um, Mike Carinara is a bus uh, fare box maintainer since 2016. He seamlessly handles multiple tasks simultaneously, all while setting up his own routine to address fare box defects, as mentioned earlier by a customer, making sure we're addressing those fare box issues and those omni issues, something we are uh, focused on, but everyone in the depot widely respects him. Celeste, there she is. She's the Director of Administration for the Office of the Senior Vice President of Buses. What does that mean? She actually runs the place, Frank. Yeah. Um, she makes things happen and gives every task her seamless execution, like getting our operator safety jackets, perfect attendance awards, and exemplary attendance awards. She's embracing our push to continue to acknowledge our employees. Celeste, thank you. She's also got a big smile around the office. So. Bus operator Sergio uh, Henry, out of our Yonkers Depot, is known as mild-mannered individual who works well with everyone and takes pride um, 
in helping his customers. Um, a recent customer commendation sent to uh, Jano is a testament to that. Where Sergio, give us, uh, there you are, you're hiding behind uh, Sammy. And last but not least, Emmanuel Dorselli, an analyst in Paratransit's Finance Administration Unit. He's been instrumental in Paratransit's compliance with our NTD database for reporting to the FTA and, of course, being part of the team that we earlier heard is delivering great service uh, for our customers. Emmanuel, congratulations. Again, you know, Chair and this committee, I appreciate spending a few minutes of this meeting to acknowledge uh, the tremendous folks at New York City Transit. We are uh, honored to have them here today. Congratulations. Congratulations to you all. It's my favorite time of the meeting that we get to um, congratulate all the hardworking men and women of the MTA. So thank you again for all the great work that you do um, every day. And that concludes our uh, my report. Okay, great. Any other questions? If not, are we ready to go? We're ready to go. Okay, I need a motion to adjourn. Midori, second. Jamie, all those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. We need a photographer so we can take a picture with all the all-stars. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>